Welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be chairing this research seminar on behalf of the British Centre for Literary Translation. From mother tongue to other tongue, negotiating the cultural politics of literary translation. My name is Cecilia Rossi and I am Associate Professor in Literature and Translation at the University of East Anglia. And also this semester, I'm Acting Director of the BCLT while the, the professor, professor Duncan Large is away on study leave. As postgraduate and professional liaison for the British Centre for Literary Translation, I run the BCLT residency programme. At the moment, I'm in Chile, in the city of Temuco, capital of the Araucanía region, which is the territory of the Mapuche people, as I'm attending a meeting of translators and interpreters from indigenous languages from Latin America, organised by the University, Catholic University of Temuco and UNSAM, Universidad Nacional de San Martín. So I should say, Mari Mari Compuche, as they say here, in Temuco. So I'm delighted to be introducing Jason Kalatil, uh, the author of a children's book, The Sack Clothman, which has been translated from Malayalam, Telugu, translated into Malayalam, Telugu, and Hindi. Her translations have won the G JCB Prize for Literature in 2020 and the Crossword Books Jury Award for Indian Language Translation in 2019. And her latest translation, Valley by Sheila Tommy was shortlisted for the JCB Prize for Literature and the Atta Galata BLF Book Prize in 2022. And more recently, in May this year, Jaysari was awarded for this translation, the B. Abdullah Memorial Translation Award, which is a hugely prestigious prize. So many congratulations, Jaysari. Before becoming a full time translator, Jaysari worked in anti-racism and human rights in relation to mental health and psychosocial disability for over 20 years. Her works in this area include the volume Recovery and Resilience, African, African, Caribbean and South Asian Women's Stories of Recovering from Mental Distress. And she also co-authored a textbook called Values and Ethics in Mental Health, an Exploration for Practice. Jaysari comes originally from Kerala, India, and currently lives in a small village in the New Forest in England. Jaysari has been a translator in residence for the BCLT during the last four months. And he has been translating a children's novel, Tommy, Princess of Gardens, by Kerala writer Kapoor Arakal, told through the friendship between a young girl from a from the Kurumba tribe in the 17th century and the son of a doctor in the present. The book deals with indigenous knowledge and of medicinal plants and present day concerns about the environment. Alongside translating this book, Jesuit has also been exploring questions to do with translating history, especially colonial history, and also translating for children. You can read her latest blog on newwriting.net, precisely on translating children's books. She's also interested in issues around being a translator from a minority community living in the UK and how these questions can be embedded in wider discussions on translation as a cross-cultural practice. So, very welcome, Jaysari. Yeah, so um, today I thought I would share with everybody um, some research that I've been undertaking, and it is quite at the beginning stage. It's a research project um, of an autoethnography of the literary translator as an immigrant and a woman of color. Um, it has this is a project that has evolved almost organically over the last five years as I got more and more interested and involved in literary translation. <clears throat> I'm in particular interested in exploring three interconnected things from the perspective of the translator as an immigrant woman of color, positionality, politics, and practice. And I find that autoethnography as a methodology seems to suit what I want to explore and how I want to do it, because it involves exploring the self, that's auto, in the context of the collective or the people, ethnos. It also validates the use of um, reflexive use of personal experience to describe, to analyze, and to interrogate institutional spaces and practices. And it also allows to focus on the intersections between self and society, between the personal and the political, 
and between the specific and the general. Um, so I've been keeping a journal about my practice as a literary translator for a while now, while I have also been researching and reading what other translators have to say about their own positionality, politics, and practice. I've also been reading memoirs and autobiographies. Often I find that the famous, the ones that are usually recommended um, to translators, do not often speak to me as an immigrant woman of color, working from a non-European language into English. Um, examples that I can give you is Grigori Rabasa's If This Be Treason or Kate Flick's This Little Art. But meanwhile, I'm also discovering voices that integrate, inter interrogate these institutional and structural rigidities and articulate solutions voices that legitimize and help articulate my own concerns. And I want to uh, mention two books in particular here. One is called Violent Phenomena, a collection of 21 essays edited by essays on translation by translators edited by Kavita Bhanot and Jeremy Tiang. And the other is a book called Letters to a Writer of Color, edited by Deepa Anapara and Temur Subro. I, I, for me, these are um, collective autoethnographies, and these have influenced very much in what I'm going to present to you today. Um, in his essay, Cultural Identity and Diaspora, Stuart Hall, the cultural theorist, said, we all live, write and speak from a particular space and time, from a history and a culture which is specific. What we say is always in context or positioned. In the context of literary translation, this is true of the translator as well as the translated text. And as I develop my practice as a translator, I find myself more and more interested in this question. What does this positionality mean when a particular translator takes a particular text across space and time, across histories and cultures? I translate from my mother tongue, Malayalam. That's the main language of Kerala, which is the southernmost state of India. And it is also one of the languages spoken in the Lakshadweep archipelago, which is in the Arabian Sea and is a union territory of India. Around the world, around 80, sorry, 38 million people speak this language, making it one among the top 30 languages spoken in the world. In India, it is also one of the 22 official languages, one which is designated a classical language and has a rich literary history. I translate into an other language, English. This formulation for me is important, formulating English as the other, because ordinarily it is our languages that are called other tongues. Historically, English is the language of the oppressor, the colonizer of my country and people. Personally, it is just another language in, a, in the multilingual context that I grew up in and continue to live my life, to read and to write. It is also the language of cultural and social capital, of privilege, of upward mobility. My parents were well aware of this when they chose to give me an English education. I was the first person in my entire extended family to study in an English medium school. I do this work sitting here in the UK, far away from the context and culture of my mother tongue, with no immediate access to a Malayali cultural community. I do it as a migrant living in the country of our erstwhile oppressors. Like many people in my generation, I grew up reading translations. Russian folk tales and children's stories became part of my childhood, primarily thanks to a couple called um, Omana Gopalakrishnan and Moscow Gopalakrishnan. Her husband was known by the name Moscow Gopalakrishnan. Later came fiction that was translated from Indian regional languages, mainly from Hindi, Bengali, Marathi, and Kannada, as well as from Spanish, Russian, English, and French. I don't think I was conscious at that time that about the fact of translation at that time, that a story from one language had been recreated in another language by an actual person who is not the original 
teller of that story. My reading and writing self that in that way has been heavily influenced by stories that crossed borders. I too have crossed borders. As a translator, I help texts cross borders. Borders are always on my mind. Um, I want to share a small section from my journal with you. Board, that, that squiggle in the middle, that is supposed to be barbed wire in case anybody is you know, wondering what that is. <laughs> okay. Borders and border crossings are positioned in histories and pol politics, defined and redefined in space and time. Borders are experienced differently by different people. For some, they are porous, accommodating, welcoming. For others, they are rigid, hostile, heavily guarded. Some crossings are easy, joyous, eagerly awaited on both sides, while others are arduous, labored, policed. I came to the border armed with privilege of caste, of education, of language, of migration by choice rather than necessitated by war, displacement, oppression, or economics. However, borders also have a way of taking away privilege. On an everyday basis, I watch my language disappearing into insignificance along with a hundred other languages that my immigrants speak. In that way, migrant lives are constantly in translation. The sound of our names, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the lilt of our words, the stories we tell are constantly living in translation. Translations are border crossings too, yes. But as with bodies that cross, cross borders, texts also experience borders differently. I began looking at this first by getting a sense of the context. To look at uh, literary translations published in the UK and the US mainly. It's a little hard to get at these numbers, I realized, but there are some studies and analysis, and I'm going to share some of these with you. So the first one is um, from a study by Literature Across Frontiers published in 2017 um, that looked at literary translations published in the UK. And these are numbers for the years between 2000 and 2015. So according to this study, over 70% of all the trans literary translations published in that period was from 10 source languages. Nine out of 10 of these are European. It was 10 out of 10 till about, I think, 2014, when Japanese knocked Danish out of the table. Um, and as you can see, French at the top there with 1,562, and Indian languages, all of the Indian languages combined was 80. And that's the breakup of, on the other side is the breakup of the languages. Um, what languages they are. In, in this, as you can see, there are no books from the language I translate from. Now, I want to, I want to also share another slide, which is translations in the USA. And this, this I, have, I um, took from sort of looking at the uh, Publishers Weekly database. That includes all the book, all the literary translations published in the US, as well as those published in the UK, but are marketed in the US. And here too, uh, the total numbers from Indian languages is 69. And there are three books between the periods of 2008 to 2022 that are from Malayalam. French, Spanish, German tops the chart again. So, Obviously, borders are experienced differently by texts as well. And as I get more and more immersed in this field, I find myself more and more interested in the process and politics of these border crossings. Writing in the introduction of a curated edition of work by women of color, it's called Kitchen Table Translation, translator Madhu Kasa says, when the movement of texts, that's translation, is linked with the movement of bodies, that is migration, Issues of language and culture necessarily collide with questions about politics, history, race, and imperialism, the very context of migration and diaspora. 
I am learning that this collision can take several forms. So recently I had the opportunity to discuss with a British editor of a book that I have translated. This book will be out in India next year. The book is a story of a young woman growing up in the 70s and 80s, a Bildungsroman of sorts, a funny, poignant story set in Kerala's Christian community, engaging with the themes of madness, alienation, and finding one's place in this world. I met this editor at a literary event and, as requested, sent in a synopsis of the story and a few pages of the sample translation. And since I experienced our meeting as positive and the editor as someone who, in her own words, was looking for new and different stories from India, I was quite optimistic about this. And then I got the response, her response by email. Nothing much was said about the novel or its translation, except for a general statement about how she liked the language and writing. But she rejected it. Because, she said, there is nothing fundamentally Indian about this story. Now, I don't think the author of the book I pitched set out to write an Indian novel, if there is such a thing. I think she simply wanted to tell a story that, write a story that she wanted to tell, set in Kerala, within her community, in the space and time of her life. The idea of a fundamentally Indian novel is steeped in the baggage of imperialism. In the, in, the, in the almost unassailable stereotypes that keep appearing in certain kinds of Indian novels that are very familiar in the West, the tropes of the insular or uncouth immigrant, for example, Jumba Lahri's The Namesake or Monica Ali's The Brick Lane, or what writer and translator Jenny Bhatt calls the mango discourse, with flavors such as arranged marriages, saris, and slums. The realism of poverty set against monsoons and magical skies. Meanwhile, in India, contemporary writing in regional languages is engaging with a variety of issues. In Kerala, Malayalam literature currently is marked by storytelling that is steeped in the regional and the local resisting the call to imagine India as a single story, talking back to the political insistence to recast India as a singular discourse rooted in religious and ideological fundamentalism. My second example is based on a conversation about my latest translation, Walli by Sheila Tomei. It was published in India last year, and as Ceci said in the introduction, it, has won, it was shortlisted for a couple of national awards. At the same event, I had the occasion to chat to an agent who actually, who actually approached me because she said she was actively looking for translations from Indian languages and had recognized my name. After telling me about the type of books that she liked to acquire, books that addressed gender, race, class, and the environment, preferably written by women writers, she asked me about the books I was working on. Walli fit the bill perfectly, I thought, and I began telling her about it very enthusiastically. But she stopped me fairly quickly. I've seen the book, she said. I don't think it will appeal to English readers. So the reason why she thought it wouldn't appeal to English readers was because there in Wali, there are dialogue, some dialogues and songs in the text that are transliterated in their entirety such as the passage you see in front of you. Wali is set in Vayanad, a land of forest up in the hills of the Western Ghats at the northern end of Kerala. Many of the characters come from the Paniyar community, which is one of India's indigenous Adivasi people. They speak a language called Paniya, which is separate from Malayalam, in which the main, the, most of the novel is written. But when the char Paniya character, Paniya characters speak in the novel, they speak in Paniya, not in Malayalam. Paniya has no script of its own and uses Malayalam when it is written down. As with most Adivasi languages, it is being lost because of the takeover by mainstream languages. This loss of language and voice is a key theme in the novel. In fact, the dedication of the book by Sheila Tommy reads, for forests ravaged by fires, 
for people rendered voiceless for languages without scripts. It would have been possible to simply translate the Paniya alongside the Malayalam into English. But if I did so, as I explained in the translator's note in the book, it would perpetuate the silencing of the language that the novel is actively resisting. I chose instead to retain them after rendering them phonetically into English, immediately following them with the translation. So for instance, in Chandikyu Ponda, he said, don't go in the night. Puye kadakano, kaadu patayam, pambu patayam ulavai. There was a tone of command in the gruff voice as he told them about the river to cross and the snake-infected lanes through the forest. Erite puva, go in the morning. My hope was that those English readers who would be interested could try voicing them out just to hear what they sound like. And those who were not could just read the English because everything is translated. Nothing is left untranslated. I was also taking a lesson from Cherokee writer Diane Glancy, who retained words and phrases written in that script in her English novel, Pushing the Bears, so that they function, as she says, holes in the text so the original can show through. I explained, I tried explaining all this to the agent. She nodded along with me and said, I understand why you did it, but still, English readers don't go for this kind of thing. So, who is this English reader? I have come across this person before many times. I am an English reader. All the people who are reading Wali in India are English readers. But this person does not seem to represent any of us. Are there, many English, there are many Englishes in the world and presumably many types of English readers. And this is another page from my journal where I was trying to figure out this idea of the ideal reader. And in the background are all the Englishes that the OED lists on their website. So there are many Englishes in the world and presumably many types of English readers. So how could one type of English reader represent all of these people? So in my journal, I drew a unicorn, a creature as mythical as the English reader. Still, doubts remained. Was I just being cantankerous and missing something obvious? And then I came across an essay by translator Anton Herr on this subject. The mythical reader is actually a minority in the reading world, writes Herr, but everyone in publishing defers to him. He won't read women writers or non-European translations. He is incredibly finicky in a way that suggests people have been indulging him all his life instead of challenging him or encouraging him to try new and different things. What he likes seems to be other white men and whatever other white men produce. If he reads translated literature, he might read an obscure dead white male from Germany or Italy or even some author of, from a non-European country, if at least the translator is white. He likes, a few, he likes very few things and hates an awful lot of things. Over the years, I would constantly be nudged or told outright to write like the English reader, to think like the English reader, to make the world comfortable for him, my sentences and content easier for him. It was a long time before I realized that Saying the English reader won't like this really just meant you are not white. The English reader, it turns out, after all, is a unicorn, not only mythical, but white. But he guards the borders with the fierce determination that makes most border crossings impossible. So this insistence on a fundamentally Indian story that appeals to the mythical English reader is, as, a, as writer and activist and disability, artist and disability justice campaigner Kairani Baroka calls it, an act of colonial extractivism. Translation is almost always talked about as a good thing, a bridge between cultures, an act of friendship and accommodation. It is all of these things. However, it can also be an act of complicity of conforming to the desire born of an imperial mindset to acquire and assimilate. 
an act of Orientalism as defined by Edward Said, to domesticate and to exoticize. So for me, the whole debate around domestication, domesticization, domestication and foreignization is not only stylistic, it is of another nature. It, 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 it brings in all the baggages of that attached to language itself, baggages of race, of colonialism, of gender, etc. So the question then is, how do I negotiate these demands in my practice? I think for me, the first step is really to acknowledge that translation is inherently a political act. From choosing a book to translate to the type of English I might use, to negotiating editorial demands, the process and practice make evident the politics of borders and border crossings. What remains when we are at the other side of the border matters. That means paying attention to how I translate, how I use this other tongue that is at once foreign and familiar, at once oppressing and enabling. Translation is also a labor. We talk, although nowhere near enough, nowhere as near as, as, as needed, about the material aspect of this labor in relation to payments, royalty, copyright, acknowledgement, etc. But it is also effective labor, and not just at the moment of rendering words from one language into another. It is labor when resisting demands for domestication or exoticization, for smoothening out differences, for censoring or purifying in the name of rules around storytelling and readability that are made elsewhere. In essence, it is labor when catering to the unicorn. Translation, I'm also learning, can also be an act of hospitality. But hospitality can be of many kinds. It can be charity, accommodation, condescension. Or it can be, as again Madhukasa puts it, a hospitality that recognizes both the dignity and the difference of the other. So I can strive not to airbrush, not to be caught in the rules about good and bad translations. I can strive to keep the differences, the ambiguities, the unease, while engaging with the otherness of English. After all, a relationship of hospitality affects both the guest and the host. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jaisri, for such a thought-provoking talk. Um, I'm sure that we're going to have lots of questions from our listeners this afternoon. Um, there is a Q&A um, function here where you can write your questions. So please do use the Q&A function and keep the chat for when you want to share things um, but if you want to formulate a question that I can ask Jaisri, I will be looking at the Q&A function. So that's where you have to direct your questions, please. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's a really, really thought provoking um, talk. And, and of course, I'm going to exercise the privilege of asking the first questions, if I may. Um, I really love this image of the translator as selves as sort of the migrant, as a self in translation, as living in translation, um, because I think that this is where I am as well, as I'm an Argentine-born uh, translator living in the UK, working in the UK and translating into English. I think I uh, totally um, identify with this idea of the self in translation and, and living in a constant state of translation. And I wanted to ask you a question about how this... Um, condition, as it were, this position, to use the word that you've um, highlighted at the beginning of your talk, how does this help you or hinder you to develop strategies for translation for a particular book? The idea of um, an immigrant life being lives in translation or selves in translation, it's not I don't, I mean, it can be a tool. It, it is a condition of existence, rather, you know, and you can take from it 
to work out how you will deal with any situation in life in the same way as you know in, in that same way you might bring it to your translation and that is what i meant by saying that you know there are you know you might feel like one these famous speeches in the uk about multiculturalism being assimilation into the dominant culture etc and there's been resistance to that from the uh, political society from groups of different people saying that that is not you know multiculturalism should probably also mean that cultures coexist equally and um, economy you know with fairness across the board so in the same way i think for translation you can as i said pander to the unicorn or you can focus your translation to bring across that elements that are all constantly in translation from the original text and that would be in the way you use language in the way you would um you know highlight certain things or the way you would even the example that i showed you is a way of trying to keep something of the something that is integral to the original text in the translation without actually smoothening out all the rough edges and so that the 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 your task of the translator which is usually said is to kind of make reading easy for the readers but i believe that every book will find its reader it does not have to be more than doubt for this imagined reader mm. yeah and pre- precisely I mean, you also have to think that perhaps the the writer of the original is trying not to make things easy for the reader this is true i mean yeah. i don't know how many you know, like when, when questions tra- sorry when when translators are all, translators i think are often told about to think about readability and ideal reader etc i'm not entirely sure if you know authors are often asked about who is your ideal reader how are you going to ensure that your book is you know readable etc because look at the variety of books that come out and we all find something that we like to read but somehow when it comes to translation it is almost as if this needs to be simplified or or i don't know i mean it's not no simplified is not the word it is about something you need in, need to do so that what is culturally specific and culturally important in that text is somehow taken away and made um thankfully though a lot of tra- most translators don't do that you know they they actually work with the original text more than what is out there as the origin uh, uh, as the ideal yeah um i can see that questions have started coming in there's a first question that is quite specific and it's asking you to please repeat the banners of the two books that you mentioned at the beginning about literary translation and i think this is a reference to violent phenomena the 20 essay the two books that you can you see uh, or yes yes i don't i mean so i i'm seeing it phenomena? upside down but yes this is by edited by kavita bhanot and jeremy tiang and the other one is not really about translation per se but it is letters to a writer of color edited by deepa anapara and temor sumru perfect thanks a lot thank so you so that i mean in a way i think this is why what what i said about author the ethnography at the beginning is that it is it 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 is inward looking as a methodology it is reflexive of yourself and you are you know it is yourself but it, uh, it you know it works collectively also because you know it it then all of these things that other people are writing producing you know becomes the knowledge base within which that reflection ha- the reflexive action happens so that's where these these books are important i think yeah absolutely um thank you very much for that jaysri there's another question uh which is actually quite interesting when a translator has privilege of let's say caste or gender do the borders between languages become a little more porous in the sense that one tends to miss out on the intricacies of the cultural impact of such oppression that's a really interesting question i do think, I think caste so i do think caste is access privilege in border crossing for the person itself to begin with um in terms of translations yes i think caste comes with it various other privileges that that you you are born with 
given, etc. And that makes that makes border crossings easier for some people. For instance, like me, you know, my caste and my class has given me the privilege of English education, etc. So, you know, it, it takes you places. In terms of get you know translations as of the text, it is about what you then choose to translate. And also when you translate, say, a book by a Dalit author, this thing I talked about, you know, not pandering to a specific kind of English or rules or um, how how you use language, what you leave out, etc. That you are that there is demanded of you. I think the translator has to be really careful not to do any of those things because if 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 you are if you are translating from a position of privilege, it is your absolute ethical responsibility not to do that to the original text. So I think you know we constantly have to be mindful of privilege and where where that takes you how that takes you it's not just about you know crossing the border it is about how that that ease and unease i talked about at the beginning that is very much true of caste privilege yeah absolutely and uh, i think that a lot of your talk comes down to the question of ethics and not only professional ethics, but it's to do with that other ethics of what, what is right and what is wrong, you know, that sense of, you know, where does the translator or how does the translator negotiate that tension between, between self and other, you know, and, and that respect for the whole, the book as the whole, you know, and the, the, the author's intention. So not to sort of uh, gloss over, you know, if the original is um, causing discomfort in a way, unease, as you were saying, you know, that the translation should also not pander to this unicorn, this mythical English reader and erase the unease, but actually should also provoke those feelings of discomfort and unease. Uh, so it is about an ethical position, as you as you were saying, position as a key word, and ethical as, as, a, as a sort of guiding principle for translation. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for that. Really fascinating. Uh, we have another question, um, which is asking you to elaborate a bit on your reference to the Orientalism of Edward Said, Said with reference to translation. So, um, Said's thesis of Orientalism, um, I mean, o o mm, on a variety of things, but it is in terms of knowledge production. You know, there was the idea, if I could read a little passage out as well. The, the, the idea that how, how the project of Orientalism went about acquiring knowledge from the Orient, but then it was about how to, you know, what it then did was to domesticate that knowledge to the, so that it, 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 it is palatable to the West. Filtering it through regulatory codes, classifications, specimen cases, periodical reviews, dictionaries, grammars, commentaries, editions, translations, all of which together formed a simulacrum of the Orient and reproduced it materially in the West for the West. So for translations as well, it is about, you know, when you are translating a text that is steeped in the local and the regional in a place and a time and a history, when you are translating it for publishing in the West, et cetera, for a particular type of audience, it is important to not to do that process of Orientalism by which it is an Indian text of that time and place and et cetera, but somehow it isn't anymore. It is a recast version that is made in the West, as it were. Um, I'm simplifying this too much, but but as a translator, there are there are things that you can do not to do that. That that you your job is not to domesticate it for. So this is what I mean by when I say domestication, it is not necessarily stylistic, it is also political and philosophical in some ways that you know there's so there are things that you absolutely not do so that if there is a way as a translator you can bring that you know time and the, the context of that work 
into the context of the translation, that's what we need to do. Otherwise, it becomes, we become complicit in the part in the process of Orientalism. Yeah, very, very well put, um, J3. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I usually try to steer away from a, a discussion of organization and domestication. I like to think of foregrounding, you know, thinking about foregrounding certain stylistic features, but in the service of the bigger issues. It's not the style for the purpose of the style, but that translators have choices that manifest themselves in, in, the, in, the, in the style of the text, you know, this term, as this word, as opposed to that other word, you know, because it creates a particular rhythm. But then you think, well, that particular rhythm might be disruptive. And so you create an ease and you're sort of highlighting something that you find in the source text, that discomfort and ease that we were talking about just now. So I think that talking about uh, foregrounding certain stylistic features in order to bring, you know, the focus for the reader of the translation on those bigger issues of class, of caste, of gender, of race. Um, it seems that it's more productive than just simply talking, you know, oh, let's make it more domesticating, you know, let's make the, the, the English more readable, more fluid, et cetera, et cetera, which you come up against a lot, especially in publishing in Anglophone countries, you know, that sort of, oh, it has to read well, it has to be smooth. Uh, sometimes you want to create the opposite effect. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's one, it's a fascinating question. Um, we've got a couple more questions, actually. One that has to do with a, um, so I'll read it out. Do you think there is a difference in the expectation of readability between literary fiction and genre fiction? Have, um, I have a feeling that you have less wriggle room when it comes to genre fiction. So what, what is um, your take on that? Uh, I I don't know because I haven't really done genre fiction translation or engaged with the those debates. But I, I can imagine that there's there's probably less regal room there. I, I I wouldn't know really. Yeah, and I I suppose that a lot depends on the publisher that you work for. Probably. I mean, yeah. what is fascinating is that you know while a publisher may reject your sample translation of Bali, you know, as you were showing what, what it is that you were doing with the Adivasi um, language there by keeping it in the language, not translating it. Uh, one publisher may say, no, I don't want to do this book, but another publisher may, came, may come along and say, I want to do this book. So there is there is wriggle room there in terms of, I know, see, you know, sometimes the, the, you have no, an the, option. That I think it's a different issue from positing it as what the English reader wants. You know, translate publishers have different, you know, different publishers publish different things, and you know, some are way more experimental, etc. So that's there. But the reason given for that could be different, saying that we do, you know, these are yeah. not the kind of books that we publish, we, we prefer a different type of book, etc. But if the excuse is that is about the imagined reader defined in terms of this English reader, which seems, you know, in a, in a way that it stands for all English readers everywhere. That's where the problem comes. Yeah, you know? but, but the question of readability is tied <laughs> to this in mythical English reader because lots of publishers, oh, it has to be readable. The translation has to be smooth and fluid. No, and... That's, that's definitely connected, yeah. but readable to which English reader? <laughs> You know, yeah. this is where you have to pull apart what they mean by this English reader. And most yeah. often when you pull that apart, you see that the English by English reader, they mean a white reader in an Anglophone country, most likely UK uh, or US, and not other absolutely. English yeah. readers anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So and, that's... and I think, yeah, I think that that unpacking that Anton her has done there, you know, and the unpacking that you're doing here, the questions that you're posing here are so important, you know, because, uh, you know, it, it is it is part, part of our ethics of translation to unpack these um, concepts that are perhaps not very useful and perhaps do a lot more damage than good. 
Um, so let's go back to the questions. Uh, in your opinion, does the same translation work for both Indian and non-Indian readers, given the differences in culture, etc.? Or does the latter audience require more hand-holding? <laughs> Interesting. I mean, yeah. for me, for me, that same question can be asked in terms of does the same book by, I don't know, say any any writer from Charles Dickens to to Arundhati Roy, does the same book written in English work for Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things or Tomb of Sand, you know, whichever book, does it work for an Indian audience just the same way as it works for an audience in 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 the UK? Or did Arundhati Roy need to rewrite the book for a UK audience? No. So what is different about translation? Because if you put if if you translate a book to the best of your ability and strive to take what is in the original across to this new language the best way you can without sort of thinking about a type of audience and it's not even you know a book translated into english is also read not just by indian or non indian reader non indian re reader of english a non indian english reader are many and around the world yeah. Yeah. So how many versions would you do depending on culture? We don't rewrite a novel written in English for different cultures. So we don't really need to rewrite yeah. translations for different cultures. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think you're hitting the nail on the head here, actually, J3. I think that that thing, you know, well, if it doesn't apply to the original book, why would it apply to the translation? Why should there be a rule for 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 the original and another rule for the translation? Uh, you know, when when the translator is in fact the writer of literature in that target language, you know. Um, so yeah, it's it's actually thinking, you know, what what you think when you are proposing or when Paul publishes, say, oh no, we've got to modify this book in order for it to the, the translation, in order for it to fit better into this this readership. Well, you wouldn't do that with the original. So why why would you want to do that with the translation? It actually speaks of that. Understanding you, different hierarchies. You, you you wouldn't do that to the original in whichever language that original was. But also, you know, I'm talking more also about um, a text originally written in English. You're not going to yeah. do that separate. An Indian writing text, Indian writing in English novel is not rewritten for a British audience or an American audience. It's the same book. Yeah. What I think is that readers come to a book differently. Different readers come to a book differently. You know, they come with yeah. a whole range of things, you know, their experiences, their reading habits, you know, what they are interested in, etc. So there, I don't think there's ever going to be any book that is that can be written in such a way that it fits a culture so perfectly. That's not going to happen ever. Readers will find the books that they like to read. And, and, and I also firmly believe that every book will find its reader. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I like to say to my students, every book will find a translator and you as translators, you will also find your books, you know, that, that works vice, vice versa, you know, that there is that, that sense of hope, you know, in the, in the fact that especially when, when students try, try very hard to, to find a publisher for a book, you know, okay, yeah, you'll find the publisher because, because there will be a publisher there who will recognize that this book will 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 have its readers, you know, at some point or in some context. So there's always hope there. Um, if there's a question about translating uh, into your native language. So do you also translate into your native language from other regional Indian languages or from English itself? If so, how does that process differ from your interpreting other cultures for your readers in your homeland? Hmm. Okay. Um. Two things, I think. I think every translation involves interpretation because every translator is a reader first, a translator next. So you are interpret in the process of translation, you are interpreting a text. Okay. And, and that this is also why if two translators translated the same text, you might end up with 
somewhat different translations as well. So that said, the issue is not really about that kind of interpretation. The, the issue is about what other things are imposed on it in, in terms of saying, you know, this is what this culture, this reader will read, or this is this is the definition of a Malayalam read, Malayali reader or an English reader, and hence every book should, you know, pay, um, cater to that. I have translated into Malayalam from other Indian languages. Um, actually, that is not true. I have translated into Malayalam from English, not from other Indian languages. Um, one thing to say, based on my experience of living, having lived there and, and here in the UK, is that, as I said at the beginning of the um, my presentation, Malayali literary scene is very familiar with translations. In fact, the first Malayalam novel, according to some historians, is a translation uh, written by a colonial woman who was in Kerala that she wrote in English and then it was translated into Malayalam. Some, some scholars think that that is the first Malayalam novel. Um, we have a wealth of translations coming published routinely, regularly, and read by readers from various different languages. So I think there is something to be said about being familiar with reading from different languages, uh, both translated, you know, all of it translated into English. So there are these type of demands that I talked about here in terms of the, you know, the idea, what the ideal reader or the ideal Indian story, et cetera, does not exist in, in that Malayalam literary scene. There is no demand to say that I want a quintessentially British book or, you know, this, this book is not British enough. None of those things happen. Um, but, any, but every translation is an interpretation. So the issue is not about whether there is an interpretation process going on. It, the issue is about how translations from certain languages or times and places are seen, what, what demands are put on, the, put on them, and on the way in which they are translated. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I think that um, it's very easy to lose sight of the role of interpretation in translation. You know, you don't translate a book or you don't write a translation of a book. You write a, a, the translation is the writing of an interpretation of, your, of the book, of your interpretation of the book. Um, and, and it's always that, you know, and whether you want to call it interpretation or you want to call it reading, you know, and what, does, what do you mean by reading? But it is true that we don't translate a book. We translate our reading of yes. the book, i.e. our interpretation of the book into the target language. And I think that that is something that, um, you know, has to be highlighted uh, wherever possible. Um, yeah, and we have one more question. In a country like India, where there are so many languages, sometimes it is the English translation inadequate. It may be of a text that enables translation from one language to another. Recently, my colleague received an award for translating a work from Malayalam to Assamese. Yeah, though she did, she did it from the English translation of the work and not from the original. Okay, so this is relay translation. This is when you translate a book, not from the original, but from, from a translation. I would like to hear your opinion on this. Are you aware of this happening in the context of Indian oh, languages? Absolutely. When, you, when absolutely. the work, you know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah. So in India, there are definitely uh, translations happening between regional languages. So, you know, yeah. um, Directly, uh, in terms of, you know, for, for instance, translations of um, text from Malayalam into Telugu or Hindi or Assamese, etc. Um, and also, as the question uh, suggests, that sometimes these are done from English translations of the original into Assamese. Um, I'm not quite sure what uh, the point, the, the person asking the question wanted to know um, in terms of my opinion on how that yeah your opinion basically on the phenomenon of relay translation or the phenomenon of 
uh, translation between English, uh, between Indian languages that are actually not happening directly from, say, Telugu through, through, through English, Malayalam, but through English, through English. translation of okay. the Telugu work. Uh, uh, yeah it's similar to any such things happening right there are a lot of a tra- lot of books um translated into malayalam uh, via english i mean um books that are in say spanish or german or or other indian languages i think the the uh, like in any relay translation although it, uh, it depends on you know what the translator has done in the process because there are different things you can do in that process you know for for instance you can just stick completely only with the english version and then translate as though that was the original right on the other hand you could maybe collaborate with somebody else you know or the even the original translator who translated it into english from malayalam you know so i don't know you know how people do that so for instance if if i have translated a book from malayalam to english and you want to translate that into spanish say see you could collaborate with me even if you do not know malayalam yeah. right so there are yes. different ways in which people can do that so i'm not yeah. quite sure how this particular book was done um yeah i yeah. i think i think yeah i totally agree with you i think that we need to we need to look at the the specifics rather than than talk about generalities and 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 i think uh, also the danger though with translation from a translation is that it's not taking into account the fact that there's already been a mediation there there's already been you know it, it, what you have in your tra- in the translation that you're working from you already have an act of interpretation you already have that kind of distancing it's not a transparent rendition of the first text of the original okay so i don't really think that there is or the, i don't really think that there is or there is any use in kind of thinking about a kind of immaculate transparent translation from one language to the other i don't think that ever happens as we said already it is it is a reading that is happening yeah right i know but so, the, the assumption so, sorry may i just clarify what i was saying yeah. i think the danger is that when that practice becomes established the assumption is that people might justify the practice as oh well you know it's a translation it's a translation you know and without problematizing what a translation is they just take it as the work in in a language you know that can then be reproduced into another language thinking that somehow you, you're accessing the original and you're sort mm-hmm. of translating the original from from this translation into english into english you know first I mean I'm 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 saying that this is this is problematic because it presupposes that you can do that without questions okay okay likewise yeah. you were saying no absolutely if you have that translation in the middle you know acting as a bridge you know again bridge translation you know but that's the opportunity for a collaboration and a conversation and a collaborative creative enterprise yes. multi authored you know not single authored but multi authored and complex you know yeah. and and the process of a respectful conversation between between writers and translators great you know because you know i can tell you working in indigenous languages in latin america most translations from those indigenous languages are done via spanish you know and there are different kinds of translations into spanish and there are different ways of working and sometimes the only way in order to carry the text from one culture one very particular context into wider context is through the uh, you know step of the spanish translation first yeah, you know yeah. but again we, we're not going to talk about that but I, I I'm intrigued to to know what happens in in India and that that is very much No I mean as practice. as far as I know many different strategies happen you know I know that there are translators who have translated um between regional languages through the mediation of the English translation by collaborating with the translator of the English version and through that translator with the author 
So, I mean, for me, that would be the ideal way of translating a book um, in yeah. that sense. But I also know that, you know, a huge number of translations happen direct from an English translation and not just of regional languages in India, but also um, foreign languages where, you know, it's just direct translation from the English translation. So, you know, there are different strategies in which we can work collaboratively, collaboratively with um, translators and authors into trying to produce, you know, better translations, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I think that the exciting thing about translation is that uh, possibility, you know, the, the, the possibility of developing new practices and new forms of, of working. But also going back to the beginning of your talk, what I think is also so important is to have a space, to have that sort of paratextual space, like the autoethnography that you are sort of proposing, you know, to have the translator's diary, to have hopefully uh, that turn into a volume that mm -hmm. can inspire and guide the work of future translators, you know, that that doesn't st stay there, you know, as a collection of notes, you know, but that that all one day becomes a book. Because I think that when translators uh, explain what it is that they do, you know, reflect on their practice, but also uh, make those uh, reflective uh, processes public, it's, you know, everybody becomes richer as a result. So I think that's, that's uh, fascinating. And I'm looking forward to reading the book. <laughs> which I hope <laughs> yes, so. <laughs> In the near future. Um, I have to say, we, we don't have any more questions here, but we, we do have some very, very enthusiastic comments in the chat. Uh, what a fascinating and illuminating talk, someone says. Um, we absolutely go for, for this kind of thing. I've read other books translated like this and enjoyed them. The denial of books, this denial of books and of readers that don't fit a certain mold, such a shame, okay? Because again, you know, what you said about translation being such a wonderful thing, but it can also be limiting. It can also be, um, you know, it can also be a border. Yeah. Uh, rather than that bridge, you know, the, or the, the possibility of dissolving that border, it can actually raise the border even higher. So, so I think that that recognition is very important. Uh, yeah, some really lovely positive comments here. Um, is there anything else that you might want to talk to us about, J3? No, I mean, just when uh, when we were discussing that question asked about the um, translation via English from Malayalam to Assamese, I was thinking just just as a, just as a different way of translation. Just thinking about um, there's somebody I was talking to in a, in a, in a writing group where she wanted to translate her grandmother's book. So her grandmother wrote in Sindhi, and uh, the person I was talking to speaks really good Sindhi I mean, perfectly um, and also reads and writes in English, but she doesn't read Sindhi. So she was saying, you know, I, in, because I don't read Sindhi, I don't know, you know, I, I would love to translate my grandmother's book, but I don't know how. And I suggested to her that maybe the way you can do it is that your grandmother could read it to you. Um, or you could even make a recording of that reading because your your understanding of Sindhi is perfect. It's the actual, you know, you can't read uh, from the from the script. And she is doing that translation in that way, which also is like, you know, it, it, it opens up really interesting things in terms of intergenerational work on a, on a text between grandmother and granddaughter, um, you know, of translating a book based on the author reading it out to it, it brings other elements of you know uh, not just the visual element of looking at the text but also you know the lilt of dialogues etc as the author imagined it I think that that there are many different ways in which we can imaginatively think about how to translate as well I think yeah absolutely um yeah different ways of translating different you know possibilities processes you know um, and especially when you are um, living in, in very multilingual communities, uh, the possibilities then become endless. <laughs> uh, and then you have that intergenerational dialogue, uh, which is fascinating. Um, th there is one more question here, um, which um, 
is asking you to reflect on the concept of trans creation. How does that fit into your practice? Um, it is a buzzword, but does it really mean anything? So that's the question. Okay, so yeah, uh, yeah, trans creation. You know, you you. I, I don't know. I mean, because I'm South American, um, I kind of grew up with that question of, you know, the concrete poets from Brazil, Haroldo, the Campos, you know, he, he, he came up with the concept of transpiration. So you've got to look uh, into that to understand where it's coming from. I don't know whether this term is now used as a buzzword. Well, I get I get asked in many many interviews about whether I think translation is transcreation. Um, okay. Um, I'm not sure if I quite, you know. I do believe that the translation is a new creation of the original yeah. text. Yeah, that it is not the same text. It is. Yeah. It. It is. It is. It is the text, but it is written by is the translator. The <laughs> yeah, yeah. It so is another text. It's, it's not, yeah. and and you could. I mean, there's also always also been uh, another word that's always also been used is co-creation with the author. Yeah. But in the in the works that I've done so far, I mean, it the, the idea of co-creation kind of um, imagines very close working between author and translator, which hasn't happened in any of the books that I've translated. Authors were always involved. They always read the drafts, etc. But it wasn't like we were creating it together. Working together. But yeah. Working together. But I do believe it is, you know, I, I like this, that the, the, the book that I translated that won the JCB Prize for Literature, the author, S. Harish, always says this in his interviews, that if Misha, that's the name of the original book. If Misha was my book, Mustache is the book that Jesse and I created together. That's how he puts it. Um, and I think That's there's lovely. something, some, yes, and I think there's something in that, in the sense that even yeah. though you're not like closely working together, there is a new creation of the same thing that is happening, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I don't know whether, whether the, you know, the, uh, ubiquity, as it were, of that term transcreation, um, you know, is, is coming from, from a lot of conversations that we're having about translation as a creative writing practice. Oh. I don't know whether, you know, that's where, you know, some people think, oh, transcreation is co-creation co points to collaboration. Obviously, creation points to, to the fact that, indeed, the translation is new writing, you know. Uh, translation as a creative writing practice is, I must admit, something I adhere to, you know. Yes. Um, I totally, and I, I always say that my coming to translation was via the pathway of creative writing. You know, I started writing in English and that's how, you know, I naturally sort of moved towards translation into English because my writing was established as English writing or writing in English, exophonic writing. Um, so, so yeah, so I would suggest to, to, um, to the, the, the person, the participant who posed the question to look at uh, Haroldo de Campo, to look at the concrete poetry of Brazilian poetry of the beginning of the 20th century, to look at how they did translation, how they wrote poetry, and perhaps some answers will, will come uh, from there. Uh, because it's actually quite uh, fascinating to trace um, a particular term in search for a concept, as it were. You know, you've got the term that has been used, but as it was used and then it migrates to other contexts, it becomes a new concept. So I think that I would recommend tracing the 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 life of the term, as it were, and trying to elucidate the concept in the process. Uh, there are some really lovely questions about. Um, uh, perhaps this is the best way of doing a translation in direct contact with the author. Yes, if one had the time and if authors had the time, wouldn't that be lovely? Um, now, on that subject, uh, I just wanted to ask you a final question, Jason, because you've done the translation of this children's residency. And I remember in one of our conversations on <laughs> Teams, you said, Oh, I'm ready to send this translation to the author. So, um, what has happened? 
uh, as a result, have you entered into a discussion with the with the author? Is there any suggestion from the author that there might be a publisher interested? Have you started approaching publishers? The author is currently reading the manuscript. Um, he's quite unwell, so he has not been able to read it as you know oh, otherwise okay. he would have. But I mean, the only comment I have got so far is that it flows. That's it. <laughs> so Brilliant. Hoping, I can yeah. say I can <laughs> say that you share that page with us uh, yeah. at the translating for children workshop. Uh, on the MA in Literary Translation BCLC, and we, yeah, it's lovely. I would want to read that book as yeah, it is. So I, you have, know? I, I have not started the process of approaching uh, publishers. I mean, what the residency, as I have said before, has made happen is that this is probably the first time I have translated the entire book before I have a publisher. Because usually I work out a few chapters, etc., and then kind of see whether there's interest in it. But the residency has given yeah. me the time to actually complete the book. Because I also think in the, in the case of this particular book, it might be best if whoever reading it read the whole book rather than a sample. Because yeah. it's not really about writing style. It is also about a whole bunch of, whole lot of other things about the how the story, yes. et cetera. Yeah. So that is, that's been very, yeah. very, I'm, I'm very grateful to BCLT for that, for that opportunity. Yeah. Um, but I haven't trans, um, started the process. I'm still kind of playing with, do I approach an Indian publisher first or do I bring it here? I don't know. I mean, I haven't decided. I, I will decide yeah. all of that in conversation with the author when he is better, in better health. Yeah. yeah, fascinating. Do you realize that you will have to tell me the end of the story? Okay, so I'm going to drop you a line a few, a few, a few months uh, later <laughs> yeah. after Definitely. today is the last day of your residency. Technically, yes. but this is by no means over. Okay, I will be emailing you, and we have another chat uh, to to uh, catch up on the news of this book. Um, Definitely. So, yeah, I, I think it's it's a very happy note to end. On, I think thinking about the possibilities of translation, also the possibilities of residencies, which offer that space, that that little bit of headspace, but also the um, the chance of knowing that you have a stipend, knowing that you've got something coming in at the end of the month, so you can actually put some time aside to uh, to do translation or to make a translation. Because again, one of the, the the great things that you highlight is doing the whole book sometimes does justice to the whole book. Because it's, it's in translating the whole that you have a sense of the, the, the strategy, whether your strategy works or doesn't work, you know, uh, and also does justice to the book, you know, as you, uh, you know, share it with either author or publishers, potential publishers. Um, so, um, yeah, so we're going to say bye bye for now. <laughs> We're going to say bye bye to all the participants and thank you very, very much for being there and asking so very many wonderful questions and writing so wonderful, uh, such wonderful comments in the chat. Uh, you know that this has been recorded and it will be edited slightly and uh, then put up on the YouTube channel of the British Centre for Literary Translation and we'll share it through social media when the link is up. So it's only a um, temporary bye bye for now until you see it uh, us again on the YouTube channel. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you so thank much. Thank you, everyone. Tracy. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions as well. <laughs>